Subcommittee will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the subcommittee at any time. We welcome everyone to this morning's hearing on the federal judiciary in the 21st century, ideas for promoting ethics, accountability, and transparency. I will now recognize myself for an opening statement. Good morning and welcome. To, today we begin the first in a series of hearings on the state of the federal judiciary in the 21st century. In this hearing, we will investigate ideas for promoting ethics, accountability, and transparency in the federal courts. We focus on these ideas in our first hearing on the judiciary because they flow from two foundational principles of due process. First, that no one can be a judge in his own case. Second, to quote, former Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter, quote, justice must satisfy the appearance of justice, end quote. Justice must satisfy the appearance of justice. Both rules embody the understanding that the Constitution's implicit promise of equal justice under law depends on at least two things, that our court must be fair, independent, and impartial, and that we must also believe that our courts are fair, independent, and impartial. Justice must satisfy the appearance of justice. It might take a second, but we intuitively understand that. It means that, as the Supreme Court recently explained, quote, both the appearance and reality of impartial justice are necessary to the public legitimacy of judicial pronouncements and thus the rule of law itself, end quote. I think that's why people are so surprised when they learn that the Supreme Court isn't bound by a code of ethics unlike nearly every other court in America. It just doesn't fit with their understanding of what it means to be a judge, let alone a justice of the United States Supreme Court. And that's why it's so concerning when a justice does something prohibited by the code of ethics they don't follow and that every other judge does. That is why I was proud to introduce H.R. 1057, the Supreme Court Ethics Act, which would require a code of ethics for the Supreme Court. I was also heartened to learn from Justice Elena Kagan's recent testimony that the Supreme Court may also be discussing whether to adopt a code of ethics on its own. This would be a welcome development, and I hope that this hearing and the show of support for my bill will encourage this discussion to continue in earnest. I'd like to turn to the second principle framing today's hearing, that, one, that no one can be a judge of their own case. Everyone understands this. That's why people find it so troubling that when a potential conflict of interest arises, each justice decides for him or herself whether or not to be recused from a case without anyone else reviewing their decision. The same basic concern arises when people learn that if they think a lower court judge is too biased to fairly decide their case, that same judge is the one who decides whether he or she needs to step aside. The fact that judges don't normally explain these decisions doesn't make things any better. I think it's clear that these problems aren't, I think it's clear that these problems aren't resolved if we think a judge or justice made the right decision or even when we reflect on the competence and integrity of each judge of each and every judge. We are talking about the rule of law, and that means rules and laws, not outcomes or individuals. And that brings us to you. This is a distinguished panel, and I very much look forward to hearing your ideas on how Congress and this subcommittee can help the courts solve these problems. I also want to hear any concerns you might have, and I'm especially interested in your thoughts on the constitutional principles at play when Congress establishes rules for judicial conduct and procedure. And I hope you'll be willing to work with us as we move forward from this hearing. Thank you, and I look forward to your testimony.
And it is now my pleasure to recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, the gentlewoman from Alabama, Ms. Roby, for her opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Johnson, and thank you to all of our distinguished witnesses for coming to testify today. I've seen firsthand the importance of the judiciary, and I'm proud to be ranking member of this subcommittee to help ensure our courts have the structure, tools, and resources to make sure they operate efficiently and effectively. People all across the United States turn to the federal court system to settle disputes and adjudicate cases in a fair and impartial manner. Our courts deal with intricate issues and complex law to reach a decision based on the merits of the case, and it is important that the public have trust in these judicial decisions. Today's hearing is titled The Federal Judiciary in the 21st Century, Ideas for Promoting Ethics, Accountability, and Transparency. Specifically, we're going to be discussing at this hearing a code of conduct for the Supreme Court justices, posting judge and justices financial disclosures online, and the posting of recusal notices and a reason for the recusal online. Congress should constantly be considering how we can work with the federal judiciary for greater transparency and efficiency, and I'm interested in hearing from our uh, witnesses this morning. However, I have concerns with the possible negative consequences from these proposals. Current proposals would require the Judicial Conference to create a code of conduct for federal judges and justices. This is both questionable and repetitive. Federal judges are currently already covered by the Judicial Conference's code of conduct, and the Judicial Conference does not oversee the Supreme Court. It seems strange that we would have lower court judges creating a code of conduct for the highest court in the land. There are also concerns that requiring a code of conduct for the Supreme Court would be unconstitutional. I also understand that Chief Justice Roberts is working on a code of conduct for the Supreme Court justices and would like to learn more about the progress that has been made in that effort. There have been concerns raised with posting judges' financial disclosures online. With the high profile and sometimes contentious decisions that judges must make, there are unique safety and security concerns. I'm from Alabama and I remember quite vividly when Ju Judge Robert Vance serving on the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals was assassinated. These security concerns are not hypothetical and they are very real. Judges face dangers from disgruntled former defendants and plaintiffs and we should act cautiously when making more personal information available that could be used to threaten the safety of judges and their loved ones. Disclosures of recusal explanations or a list of judges' recusals also raises concerns. Judges may recuse themselves from cases for a variety of reasons, many of which may be personal, and disclosure could be used by future litigants to gain an advantage. There is no requirement that members of Congress explain why they abstained from voting, and I think many of my colleagues would be opposed to such a requirement. We should fully examine what impact such a requirement might have. In closing, while we should always look at ways to ensure that the courts are transparent, efficient, and effective when adjudicating cases, I have deep concerns with these proposed changes. I would caution that we should be sure to robustly scrutinize any legislative proposals for possible negative consequences and long-term implications for our judicial system. I want to again thank our witnesses for their time, particularly on an early Friday fly-out morning uh, for being here. So thank you very, uh, very much, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you, Congresswoman. I'm now pleased to recognize the chairman of the full committee, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Landler, for his opening statement. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing today. The federal judiciary is a pillar of our nation's government, an institution nearly synonymous with upholding the rule of law. When Congress, as a co-equal branch, conducts oversight of the courts with hearings such as this one, it is with the following goal in mind, to promote and protect this vital institution in order to safeguard judicial independence and maintain public confidence in our courts. Our federal judiciary is the envy of the world, and Congress has an interest in ensuring that this hard-earned reputation is maintained. Today's hearing is part of that process. As the hearing title suggests, we are considering what is appropriate for, for a judiciary in the 21st century. Now that we are squarely situated in the, in the information age, in, in which we are accustomed to accessing practically any information information, 
with the click of a button. We should ask whether there needs to be greater transparency with respect to information regarding the federal judiciary. For example, should we require that judges' financial disclosure forms, which could indicate potential conflicts of interest, be more easily accessible? And what sort of public disclosure should be made when a judge chooses not to recuse him or herself from a case? These questions go to the heart of ensuring that the public's trust in the judiciary remains strong. Similarly, a key question for today's hearing is what, if anything, can Congress and the courts do to reinforce the judiciary's commitment to ethical conduct? What can we do to ensure that every judge's and every court's decisions regarding ethics and recusal are transparently made and procedurally fair? What can we do to make sure those decisions are understandable and accessible to the public? On this front, I'm glad to say there seems to be some bipartisan commitment toward further action. Last Congress, the Judiciary Committee passed by voice vote the Judiciary Room Act, which included the provision requiring the Judicial Conference to develop a code of conduct that would apply to all federal judges, including justices of the Supreme Court. This Congress, two bills, H.R. 1, the For the People Act, and H.R. 1057, the Supreme Court Ethics Act of 2019, introduced by my colleague Chairman Johnson, includes an identical provision. The Room Act also included the provision requiring the Supreme Court to post a short online explanation when a justice recuses her or himself from a case. I'm interested to hear the views of our witnesses on that provision. And I hope a future hearing will examine proposals to increase public access to the courts, such as the Electronic Courts Records Reform Act, which Ranking Member Collins has introduced, or legislation to make court proceedings publicly accessible by live or same-day audio or video along the lines of the Eyes on the Court Act, which I have introduced in prior years. While well, I am interested in seeing what can be done to strengthen the courts, make no mistake that I respect the difficult and important job that all federal judges and justices perform every day. Reckless sustained attacks on the integrity and legitimacy of individual justices and judges have become all too common. Physical threats against federal judges and other court officers have dramatically increased as well. We cannot ignore these realities. As both branches consider how to ensure that the, that the judicial branch keeps pace with our evolving standards for transparency and accountability in a modern democracy, we must be mindful of the safety of our judges and the women and men who assist the courts in fulfilling their responsibilities. Historically, our two branches have worked together to try to arrive at an appropriate approach to the difficult issue of balancing transparency and other concerns such as safety. I hope we can continue that dialogue in light of the changing times. To that end, I look forward to hearing from all of our distinguished witnesses on these important topics. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Congressman Nadler. I now recognize the distinguished ranking member of the full committee, the gentleman from Georgia, Representative Collins, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that, and also Ranking Member Roby. Uh, I'm glad you're holding this hearing. I think it's a, a great time, and I'm glad to have a, the witnesses here on a Friday morning. What a way to start the weekend. You know, I get a smile from most of you there as we go. But uh, again, this is a subcommittee for, is holding this hearing so Congress can promote ethics, accountability, and transparency in the federal judiciary. The federal judiciary serves a vital role in the United States by ensuring that all Americans have access to fair and impartial system of justice. The federal judiciary has held itself to the highest standards of the legal profession, which has enabled it to serve as a pillar of our democracy. In doing so, it has built a level of institutional trust that is vital to, for it to continue in its role as the arbiter in some of the most bitter disputes. In order to maintain that trust, courts must ensure that they are transparent and accountable to litigants and the American people. While I generally support the idea that a Supreme Court should have its own code of conduct, I have some concerns with the proposals that has been put forward by the majority. Many of these concerns are specific, are specific to the function of the Supreme Court as the highest court in the land. Difficult questions remain, such as who would administer the code applicable to the Supreme Court. Having the Judicial Conference enforcing the code of conduct would mean lower court judges would be evaluating the conduct of justices. Instead of imposing our will on the court, I would like to work with the Chief Justice to adopt a code of conduct that accounts for the unique realities of being a Supreme Court justice while maintaining appropriate public accountability. While increased transparency and availability of judges' financial disclosure certainly would be an improvement for judicial transparency, the unique security concerns, mostly was spoke of especially eloquently by our ranking member on this just a moment ago, is a concern that federal judges must uh, be considered. Judges' lives are constantly at risk. And for those of us who have worked in the 
court system, we see this more and more, uh, not only from the prosecutor standpoint, the defense standpoint, and the judges. The, the, and for those of us who've worked in the courts, that becomes a family. We know each other, we work with each other, and this has become more and more a concern that I want to make sure that we consider that as we go forward. While it's true members of Congress and the President's financial disclosure are posted online, federal judges face different risk. Daily they work in close proximity to some of the most egregious offenders in our criminal justice system. The potential that financial disclosures could be put at risk, a, put a judge at risk or their family by a disgruntled litigant is very real and very concerning. The public disclosure of ju justice's recusal explanations also could have serious unintended consequences and it could result in the parties leveraging prior explanations to the benefit of a current client. Proposed recusal requirements raise similar constitutional concerns. But that's why we're here. That's why Congress exists. That's why we have hearings, and this is something for us to bring to the table. And I'm glad that you all are here, and I'm glad that your statements have been, uh, we will hear from those in those statements that have already been forwarded to us. But uh, I look forward to this work. I look forward to this committee's work, and I want to thank the chair, uh, not only this subcommittee, but the ranking uh, the, of the committee as subcommittee as well, but also the full committee chairman as well. And look forward to a wonderful hearing. And I yield back. Thank you, Congressman uh, Collins. I will now introduce today's witnesses. Professor Amanda Frost is a professor uh, of law at the American University Washington College of Law. She writes and teaches in the fields of constitutional law, immigration and citizenship law, federal courts and jurisdiction, and judicial ethics. She has written numerous academic articles in such publications as the Duke Law Journal and the Northwestern Law Review. Her non-academic work has been featured in publications such as The Atlantic and The New York Times. Before entering academia, Professor Frost clerked for Judge Raymond A. Raymond Randolph on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit and was a staff attorney at Public Citizen. She has both her B.A. and J.D. from Harvard and was a Fulbright Scholar. Welcome. Gabe Roth is the executive director of Fix the Court, a nonpartisan organization solely focused on modernizing the federal judiciary. Originally from Nashville, Tennessee, Mr. Roth began his career as a producer at the NBC affiliate in Jacksonville, Florida. He has a BA from Washington University in St. Louis and an MS in journalism from Northwestern University. Welcome, sir. Russell Ara Wheeler is a visiting fellow in the Brookings Institution's Governance Studies Program and president of the Governance Institute. He is also an adjunct professor at American University's Washington College of Law and is a fellow of the University of Denver's Institute for the Advancement of the American Legal System. He is in his second term as a public member of the Administrative Conference of the United States. Previously, he was the Deputy Director of the Federal Judicial Center, which he first joined in 1977. Before that, he also worked at the National Center for State Courts and the United States Supreme Court. He has written extensively on the United States courts, including on judicial ethics. Mr. Wheeler has a PhD in political science from the University of Chicago and a BA from the Augustana College in Illinois. Welcome, sir. Professor Charles Gardner Jay is the J. John F. Kimberling Professor of Law at the Indiana University Mora School of Law in Bloomington, Indiana. He writes his writings on judicial conduct, ethics, selection, independence, accountability, and administration include more than 70 books, book chapters, articles, reports, and other publications. Prior to entering academia in 1991, he served as counsel to the House Judiciary Committee's Subcommittee on Courts, Intellectual Property, and the Administration of Justice under Chairman Robert W. Kastenmeyer. Professor Jay has both his BA and JD from the University of Wisconsin. Welcome, Professor. Uh, welcome back home. Uh, now, uh, we welcome all of our distinguished witnesses and thank them for participating in today's hearing. Before proceeding with testimony, 
I hereby remind each witness that all of your written and oral statements made to the subcommittee in connection with this hearing are subject to penalties of perjury pursuant to 18 U.S.C. Section 1001, which may result in the imposition of a fine or imprisonment of up to five years or both. Please note that each of your written statements will be entered into the record in its entirety, and accordingly, I ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes. To help you stay within that time, there's a timing light on your table. When the light switches from green to yellow, you have one minute to conclude your testimony. When the light turns red, it signals your five minutes have expired. Professor Frost, you may begin. Thank you, Chairman Johnson, Ranking Member Roby, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Amanda Frost, and I'm a professor of law at American University Washington College of Law, where I teach and write in the areas of civil procedure, federal courts, and judicial ethics. One of this country's great strengths is its federal courts, the politically insulated third branch of government that serves not only to check the other two branches of government, but also to decide legal questions affecting millions of Americans. Although all federal judges wield great authority, in particular, the nine justices on the US Supreme Court are powerful because their decisions apply nationwide and in constitutional cases are irreversible. For that reason, it is essential both that the judges on these courts are fair and impartial and that they be perceived by the public as being fair and impartial. The purpose of the ethics and recusal laws we are here to discuss today is not only to protect litigants and society from potentially biased or conflicted decisions, but also to protect the judiciary itself from being tarnished by allegations of impropriety. Protecting the court's reputation is particularly important today when Gallup polls have shown that the public's confidence in the courts has declined over the last few decades. There are two changes to existing ethics rules and laws that could help to improve the public's confidence in the courts, as well as the quality of the court's decision making. First, the Code of Conduct, which provides ethical guidelines for judges, currently does not apply to the nine justices on the US Supreme Court. Likewise, the Judicial Conduct and Disability Act of 1980, which authorizes investigations into allegations of misconduct by judges and also authorizes sanctions in appropriate cases, also does not apply to the US Supreme Court. The omission of the Supreme Court justices from the ethical rules that govern the rest of the federal judiciary undermines the goal of these laws to protect the reputation of the third branch of government. Congress can and should change this. Now, some people argue that there is no reason to expand these laws to apply to the justices because some justices have publicly stated that they follow the code of conduct. But voluntary compliance is not equivalent to a mandatory ethics standard, either in the eyes of the public or experience has shown in the eyes of the justices themselves. We do not have to look far to find many specific examples of conduct by justices that violates specific provisions of the code. For instance, Justices Antonin Scalia and Clarence Thomas have spoken at fundraising events for the Federalist Society, which is in conflict with Canon 4C of the code's provision, stating that a judge, quote, may not be a speaker, a guest of honor, or featured on the program of a fundraiser, end quote. More recently, Political statements by Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, criticizing then-candidate Donald Trump, and overtly partisan statements by Justice Brett Kavanaugh during his, part, during his confirmation hearings appeared to violate several of the canons, including Canon 5's prohibition against making statements regarding political candidates or engaging in political activity. In short, we cannot rely on the justices to police themselves. Second, Congress should amend the recusal statute, 28 U.S.C. section 455, to require at a minimum that judges and justices provide an explanation for their decision to recuse or remain on a case when challenged. In addition, Congress should put in place 
or, in, or encourage judges to put in place procedures to refer recusal requests to another judge on the court in at least some cases. Both of these changes are well within Congress's constitutional authority. Congress has already enacted myriad pieces of legislation regarding ethics, recusal, and judicial administration, as is appropriate under the Necessary and Proper Clause of the Constitution. As most justices themselves recognize, the judiciary's reputation is essential to its institutional legitimacy, that is, to the public's respect for and willingness to abide by its decisions. The changes I have discussed would bolster the court's reputation and safeguard its integrity, and thus will strengthen and not diminish the third branch of government. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, and you came in right at five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Roth, you may begin, sir. Chairman Johnson, Ranking Member Roby, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the invitation to testify today. My name is Gabe Roth, and I am the Executive Director of Fix the Court, a national nonpartisan organization that advocates for greater transparency and accountability in our federal courts. I want to be clear from the start. None of the measures we are calling for today on ethics recusals and disclosures would require a significant change in the way the courts conduct themselves. The Supreme Court already says it holds itself to a high ethical standard. Here, we are merely asking that they write those standards down so that we can see and understand them. Every federal judge and justice already fills out a financial disclosure report each year, which eventually is made available to the public. We are merely asking that they make them public on the internet. And all judges and justices recuse themselves from petitions and cases when appropriate and for particular reasons. All we are asking is for them to share with us the general category of conflict that caused them to conclude that a recusal was necessary. Look, it's the summer, and we're not trying to assign the judiciary a lot of additional work. We just want them to show their work, the work they say they're already doing to ensure they're meeting the high ethical standards that the public wants to hold them to. Now onto the proposals. First, on whether the Supreme Court should have a formal binding code of conduct. Now, do I believe that a SCOTUS ethics code would, would stop a judge or justice from speaking publicly about a presidential candidate or accepting gifts from a well-known political donor? Would it make a judge or justice reconsider appearing at an annual fundraiser for a partisan organization or sitting on a case involving a publishing company who has just paid her a hefty book advance? Maybe, that, that's as good as I can give you, maybe. But that's simply better than trusting that these ethically murky practices that are not covered by the recusal statute will suddenly stop occurring each year. I present these examples not to single out any individual justice, but to demonstrate that although the High Court's opinions may be final, its members are not infallible. This mortality is re readily acknowledged by other courts and by other branches of government. The top courts in nearly every US state follow an ethics code that's modeled off the judicial conferences. Similarly, the courts of last resort in nearly every modern democracy have a formal conduct code. Congress, as you well know, has an Office of Ethics to Ethics Committee and a Code of Official Conduct. The Executive Branch has an Office of Gov Government Ethics and, a, and Standards of Ethical Conduct for Branch Employees. It follows that the Supreme Court should at least have an ethics code. Second, on whether annual financial disclosure should be posted online. So again, Congress and the Executive Branch already permit a version of their disclosures to be posted online, so we know it can be done. When it comes to the disclosures of justices and judges, it should not be left to fix the court to act as the middleman, first obtaining the TIFF files from the disclosure office, then converting them to PDF files, and finally posting them online as we did last week. Primary sources should be posted by the primary source. Current disclosure regulations state that members of the public who wish to obtain a disclosure must check a box on their request form, promising they won't use the information for any commercial purpose or to obtain a lien against a judge. But there's no reason that that checkbox couldn't be placed online. When the ideas for disclosures are brought up, the Judicial Conference inevitably cites privacy concerns as the reason for opposition. I share these concerns. I'm happy that SCOTUS is doing a top-down uh, security review and that the FY20 budget has an additional $34 million for the Marshal Service to protect the judiciary. But I also believe we can find a way to balance privacy with the public's reasonable desire to know within a reasonable amount of time whether its judges and justices are trying to hide something, like junkets or gifts, from their 30, 330 million constituents. Finally, on why judges and justices' recusal explanations should be made public, the exercise of appending a few words to a recusal notice 
would not only improve institutional accountability, it would also assist the justices to think more about their conflicts of interest. Since we were founded four years ago, Fix the Court has identified several misrecusals from the justices, instances in which Justices Scalia, Breyer, Alito, Sotomayor, and Chief Justice Roberts probably should have, according to the recusal statute, disqualified themselves from hearing a case but did not. The Supreme Court used to list recusal explanations but stopped this practice in 1904 for reasons I can't figure out. This practice should be resumed in a more direct manner by asking each judge or justice simply to refer back to the language of the recusal statute when announcing his or her recusal, that it was re uh, triggered by something like one's finances, 28 U.S.C. 455b4. Pretty simple. Chairman Johnson, Ranking Member Roby, and members of the subcommittee, thank you again for the opportunity to testify. I've been honored to work with members of the subcommittee and the full Judiciary Committee over the past few years on proposals that would build a more open and accountable judiciary, and I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Roth. You came in a little bit earlier than uh, Professor Frost did. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wheeler. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Roby. Appreciate the chance to uh, appear before you today. Uh, I have laid out my positions in my statement, and I won't belabor those in any great detail here, but refer you to the statement. But in brief, I, I believe the Supreme Court should have a code of conduct, if for no other reason than its own self-interest. But with deference, Mr. Chairman, I don't think it's a good idea to ask the Judicial Conference of the United States to uh, develop a code for the court. That runs counter, I think, to the statutory governance structure for the federal courts that Congress has created. Um, I have written, and I believe, uh, that judges should explain their reasons for recusal on the record, for transparency, for appellate, process, for appellate purposes, and also to create a common law of recusal. But I do worry a bit about requiring such a statement in matters of non-financial conflicts, uh, embarrassing details that judges might decide to eschew recusal rather than reveal those, those, those matters on the record. So I think any rule has to find an exception to protect judges in that circumstance. Um, I acknowledge that the federal judiciary, where I worked for most of my career, has, is a bit uh, transparency averse. I took note in my statement of the Judicial Conference's reluctance until several years ago to post online the so-called Biden reports, reports of uh, cases that have been delayed, uh, motions that have been delayed, and uh, dis uh, bench trials that have been delayed identifying those by name. Uh, the, the, those, those are now online, but it took a while for that to happen. I do believe, however, in the area of financial disclosure forms that a little less transparency is desirable. And I, I think the, the judicial branch has hit the right a, a balance in its uh, decision to provide disclosure statements on a case-by-case -case basis appropriately redacted in the case, for the particular uh, requester. And finally, uh, because Mr. Ashmore asked me to comment about it, I, uh, uh, about the qu question of blind trust, whether judges should be required to put their holdings into a blind trust, which I think is an idea well worth considering, but at the moment it runs into the statutory mandate that judges keep themselves informed about their personal and fiduciary financial interests. I don't think you can reconcile one with the other, so there's some statutory adjustment I think is, is in order. Let me say more broadly, I came to this subject, as uh, you indicated, Mr. Chairman, as Deputy Director of the Federal Judicial Center, particularly in support of the work of the so-called Breyer Committee that Chief Justice Rehnquist appointed, uh, actually at the, at the uh, urging of uh, former chairman of the committee, Mr. Sensenbrenner, and that uh, the Breyer Committee uh, produced a, a revamped and, and uh, more aggressive administration of the Judicial, Con uh, Judicial Conduct and Disability Act. Um, in that work, though, I became aware of the tensions involved in affecting effective judicial ethics policy. The uh, Code of Conduct for U.S. judges uh, tells judges, and I think quite properly so, that they should be uh, subject to restrictions on their behavior that the ordinary citizen would find burdensome, and they should accept those restrictions willingly. I agree with that. But I also think those restrictions can't be so obtrusive as to discourage qualified individuals from accepting appointment to the federal bench or staying uh, on the federal judiciary. Uh, 
And balancing these tensions, I suggest, is not easy. Some may think these are easy, easy questions to resolve. I don't think they're easy questions to resolve, given the importance of the values at stake, the importance of judicial independence on the one hand, judicial accountability on the other, and other tensions, that, other values that are, that are in tension. So these tensions aren't e easy to balance. I appreciate the subcommittee's effort to take them on and, and deal with them, and I'd be happy to try to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, and you came well under five minutes. Thank you so much. Professor Gay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I feel as though I should not speak at all and win the, win the contest for being the briefest. Um, it's a pleasure to, uh, to, to appear before the subcommittee. I, I once served as, as counsel, and I, I really do look back with a fair amount of pride at the extent to which this subcommittee worked together uh, to produce bipartisan reform, and I really believe that the issues before the subcommittee today are of the same sort that allows for that same opportunity, and I want to focus on that. I mean, I'm going to, in some ways, try to go off script because uh, I wanted to begin by talking about why it's important to have a, uh, a, a code of conduct for the Supreme Court, but to a man and a woman on your side of the dais and here, I think there's a consensus that it is important. It's just a question of how do we get there from here. And again, I would agree, uh, I think, with Ms. Roby that the, ideally the solution is, uh, the best bet is for the Supreme Court to adopt a, a code for itself. I think that is the optimal solution. However, the court, I mean, bear in mind, and I think it's reason, it's fair to be skeptical, because we now have 50 states, all of which have Supreme Courts that have adopted codes of conduct. The lower courts have all adopted their codes of conduct. The only court in the United States that hasn't gotten to it is the U.S. Supreme Court. And so I think there's some value in keeping the pressure on. In other words, to you know, work with them, to try to get them to promulgate their own code, but to recognize that at the back of it all, uh, you know, the second best option, in my judgment, is for this body to pass legislation directing the Supreme Court to promulgate its own code of conduct. Uh, note that I do not favor the, the idea of having the, uh, the judicial conference do it for the reasons that Mr. Wheeler and others have suggested, but I do think directing the, the, uh, uh, the court to do it would be a perfectly fine and, and, and sound idea. Uh, the issue then is, would that be constitutional? Uh, is, there, is there a concern with that? And I think it, the answer is, to me, clearly yes. Uh, that Article 1, Section 8 authorizes Congress to make all laws necessary and proper for carrying into execution all powers vested in the government of the United States. And a plain reading of that provision, to me, authorizes Congress to establish a Supreme Court that's fit for duty. And if you look back to the very first Congress, uh, they did just that. Uh, in, the 17, in the Judiciary Act of 1789, it established a Supreme Court, determined its size, spelled out its duties, and included a special oath, a unique oath for all judges to take to ensure that the Supreme and lower courts were comprised of judges who were committed to principles that defined our democracy since the beginning of Western civilization. And I'm quoting from the 1789 uh, oath that, that Congress asked judges to swear to. I do solemn, solemnly swear that I will administer justice without respect to persons and will do equal right to the poor and the rich and will faithfully and impartially discharge and perform all the duties incumbent on me according to the best of my abilities and understanding agreeable to the constitutions and laws of the United States, so help me God. This is a code of conduct. This is a short code of conduct that justices are swearing to. And if Congress has the authority to require judges to take an oath to abide by core ethical precepts in the, in, in, at that point, I don't see why they have, you know, why they don't also have the, 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 the power to ask the court to elaborate on the ethical precepts to which they are willing to abide. The Judicial Conference, as I say, has expressed concerns about it doing that. I'm with you on that. I'm on board with the notion that the Judicial Conference shouldn't be that body. Courts develop their own codes of conduct. The Supreme Court should develop one unique to its. Second point that's of issue is financial disclosure. To me, the, pro the core problem begins with saying, in this day and age, making information available to the public means making it available online. It's the way we do, world, do business in the 21st century. The Judicial Conference has objected to posting judges' financial disclosure statements on the web, citing privacy concerns, and I urge you to work with the Judicial Conference to resolve those, and in that regard, I would ask one question. At this point, I can go on to the Judicial Conference, or the AO, and say, Give me reports on every one of the federal judges, and in due course I would get them with private information redacted. 
I can then post that onto the web. So what I want to know is what privacy concern is associated with cutting out the middleman and them, them posting redacted information with all of the security and private information taken out and posted. To me, I think that's the issue, and I think there's got to be a way we can fix this. Last point has to do with this qualification reform. I think judges have an obligation to provide reasons for the decisions they make, and when they decide to disqualify themselves uh, from hearing a case that they're otherwise duty-bound to hear, I think the public has a right to know why. And I think it is a little different than with, with abstaining as a legislator, because you're under no obligation, no ethical duty to participate, you know, to vote. The judges have an ethical obligation to vote, to, to participate unless disqualified. I, I understand the Judicial Conference's concern, but I think my suggestion would be, you know, one thing that with a, a report that Mr. Wheeler was responsible for writing, one possibility uh, is to go with a, a checkbox approach which requires judges to identify the grounds for, the statutory grounds for disqualification uh, without going into the details, without el elaborating on the privacy. I think, again, we can make this work. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, three out of four ain't bad. <laughs> I did my best. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, we will now proceed under the five-minute rule with questions. I will begin by recognizing myself for five minutes. Professors Frost and Gay. It sounds like you're both quite confident that Congress has both the authority and the obligation to regulate the federal judiciary's ethics and recusal practices. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. What do you make of Chief Justice's suggestion to the contrary? The, the, could you explain by, what, by that you mean his, his suggestions to the contrary that the court that the Congress doesn't have the authority? Correct. I interpret what the Chief Justice has said as saying it is an open question. In other words, that we've never gotten to this. Not that they don't have the authority. Um, and to me, you can read that two ways. One is as a warning, you know, that that don't go there because it may be unconstitutional. The other is that our system works because for 200 years, and, the, and Justice Chief, the Chief Justice adds this, for 200 years, we have a custom of abiding by these practices uh, without exception, and I think that custom is what explains why this has never been resolved. It's not that it's a problem. I mean, for 50 years, the disqualification statute has been in place, and, and no one has, has challenged it successfully or otherwise, and I think that's what's going on. All right, thank you. Professor. And I'll just, I'll just add, I mean, Professor Jay already said it very eloquently, and it's in both of our written testimony, that there are, one of the ways in which we test or determine the constitutionality of Congress's action is to look at history, to look at what Congress has done, and that's part of constitutional analysis. And we can see that since the very first Congress and the actions of the first Congress are particularly informative when it comes to the constitutionality of, of congressional action, that from the very beginning, Congress thought it had the authority and took action to regulate the courts. Both somewhat intrusive administrative provisions like the size of the court, the quorum requirement, the dates of its sessions, and also matters relating directly to ethics, such as the oath, which um, uh, Professor Jay just mentioned in his testimony. Thank so you. I think the history shows it's permissible. Thank you. Uh, what message does it send that the Supreme Court has refused to adopt a code of ethics, and what are the long-term risks associated with the court's refusal or ref failure to do so? Well, I, the message it sends, obviously, is not a great one, because I don't think we want the pub Part of what I, I care about here is not just the reality of impartial and fair justice, but the public's perception of the courts, which I think is at, at some, what, somewhat at risk today for, for many reasons beyond just the subjects of this hearing. So I think it's, it's unfortunate that the court has so far been reluctant to adopt a code of conduct for itself. Hearings like this, I think, are very valuable in pushing, hopefully, the agenda of those nine justices to rethink that. And there have been some suggestions by the court that it is now seriously considering adopting a code. So I, I think the message it has sent thus far is unfortunate, but I'm hoping that we're at a moment where it's maybe reconsidering that position and would adopt a code for itself. Thank you. We are in an era where the legitimacy of the courts is constantly questioned, and the public's faith in the Supreme Court has eroded. Is the kind of legislation we're discussing here today 
uh, appropriate uh, in this environment, uh, Mr. Wheeler? Is it uh, appropriate that we're discussing this legislation? And if you'll cut on your microphone. Right. By all means, uh, that's what Congress is here for, as my colleagues have said. Congress has been regulating the federal courts in various ways since the founding. And I think it, um, it can only contribute to a, a better understanding of what, what the federal courts are all about. I, I, I think that's a pretty obvious proposition. Uh, Mr. Roth, do you believe that the implementation of a code of conduct, conduct for the Supreme Court would change the in institution, and if so, how? I, I believe it would change the institution for the better. Uh, Faith in the courts is something that we're, is being discussed more and more, and the idea, you know, it's, it's something that people don't really realize. When you, when you talk about the Supreme Court, you think about certain opinions, certain historic opinions, what they're doing now, but when, when, you, when you tell them, oh, they, they, they don't have a binding code of conduct like the rest of the federal judiciary, it makes, it makes people think, like, well, why is that? It's, it's, and, it, and it almost, you know, makes it seem like there's something fishy when, when there probably isn't. It's just that this is what every other court has done and the Supreme Court is a court, so it should do it as well. Thank you. Uh, so as to not violate my own five minute rule, I'm going to uh, yield back the balance of my time and call upon uh, the ranking member, Congresswoman Roby, for her questions. Thank the chairman. Um, and this is for all of you, and if you could just be brief because we do only have five minutes. Um, judges oversee cases with the most egregious offenders uh, in our criminal justice system. And the U.S. Marshal Service has said that posting financial disclosures online would identify family, locations, and other information making judges and justices um, vulnerable uh, to attack. So how can we appropriately mitigate the danger uh, these disclosures might create? You just go down the line, please. Um, I think... Uh Obviously, judicial, uh, the safety of our judges is of paramount importance. I think redactions and working carefully with judges and coming up with a list of um, structures and, and, and guidelines for those redactions would alleviate that problem. I, I tend to agree that, uh, you know, you, you can't be an organization that advocates for transparency without being an organization that, that advocates for greater security. And I think those two things go hand in hand. Uh, both with the Supreme Court Police and with the U.S. Marshal Service, there's a way to work together to ensure that the justice safety remains paramount. And you know, given the fact that the Supreme Court has already said uh, in a case called Duplantier, they didn't grant cert on, that uh, financial disclosure reports are uh, constitutional, and Chief Justice Rehnquist has said he's okay with them being being posted online. Um, you know, I, I think we have an opportunity via Congress, since it hasn't happened by the U.S. courts themselves, to to move that forward while balancing privacy. I don't, I don't really have much to add to, add to that. It's, it's obviously just a question of, of balance. The courts, the, the Judicial Conference current position is that it, it releases financial disclosure statements on a case-by-case -case basis. When it does, it releases them electronically free of charge. I think that's the proper policy. But again, this is one of those tough questions. If it were easy, we would have resolved it a long time ago. It's a difficult question. I, I acknowledge that, and it's important for Congress to work with the courts to come to a, a sensible solution. And Professor Jay, before you answer, the Marshal Service has stated that public disclosure of all judges and justices would create a serious security risk. Um, so in, in your testimony, I would ask you more specifically, why should we not give deference to those security risks? Well, I, we should give deference to security risks. My question is, I think it requires a follow-up question and a conversation, because I think that, that if we accept that interest groups are currently requesting, and they are, they're requesting uh, dis disclosure statements and then publishing them online, this is already happening. In other words, and, and, and to what extent do the mar and posting it, cutting out the middleman is not going to affect that. In other words, this is a redaction problem. Redact all information that threatens the privacy of judges. Absol and safety of judges, absolutely. But if you've got to publicly disclose the redacted stuff, I don't think it makes a difference whether the judicial conference posts it online or whether interest groups, which are currently doing it, request it and then post them online themselves. And then, uh, Professor Frost, um, with the disclosure of potential conflicts that do not justify recusal, um, encourage parties to file more frivolous appeals of a judge's decision not to recuse themselves, and how would this already, how would this um, impact already overcrowded dockets? 
Well, I mean, of course, the parties have incentives themselves not to file frivolous appeals regarding recusal. They, recusal is a very sensitive topic, and to file such a motion as a lawyer who appears regularly before the same judges, that's a difficult thing for a lawyer to do. I was a practicing lawyer for many years, and, and one hesitates to do it. So there's already a great disincentive to file a motion to recuse. To take a frivolous appeal seems to me something that both in terms of the cost and the time that the lawyer would have to expend and the reputational hit that lawyer would take, it strikes me as something that would not be a, a, a big problem. And of course, if it's a truly frivolous appeal, it can be resolved very quickly. And Mr. Roth, if judges and justices' recusal explanations were publicly available, publicly available, what safeguards uh, exist to prevent forum shopping? I think that if you know, if you're a judge and, well, okay, so you can't forum shop if you're, if you're at the Supreme Court, obviously, because that's, that's, that's the only option. Um, this is gonna be like a, 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 a retrospective thing. So it's not, you know, if you have a judge who has a, a, a financial conflict, you know, first of all, you, might, you may learn that in the annual financial disclosure reports when they come out. And secondly, if you learn it in, a, in an early stage of the case, you know, that's fine. I mean, that, that's, that's, the, that's the statute working. There are no, I mean, there are no protections, particularly when you're talking about at the lower court level. Um, but, okay, I'm going to move on. Um, similarly, similarly, are you cut me off? Okay, I'll come back to round two. Thanks. Thank you, uh, madam. Uh, next, we will have five minutes of questioning from the chairman of the full committee, committee uh, Congressman Nadler from New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Professor Frost, um, how would you enforce a code of ethics uh, on the Supreme Court? So that's a tough question. I guess I would say one step at a time. So my first goal for the Supreme Court would be to have a code of ethics. Um, because of its prominence and its, uh, the public attention the justices get for their daily activities, I would hope one enforcement mechanism would simply be that they would buy into it, they would agree to it, they came up with it, they signed on to it, it's now binding on them, they would follow it. If that doesn't happen, the second line of defense is there's a great deal of public attention focused on those nine people, and the criticism would have more bite and go further if they were violating provisions of the code. Now, the next step is, should we have some sort of enforcement a mechanism like we do for the lower court judges with the Judicial Conduct and Disabilities Act? I'm open to having that discussion. It's a complicated question. I'd want us to be careful. But I guess I'd say one step at a time. Let's get a code in place first. Does anybody else want to answer that question? About, um, about the enforcement of the code? <clears throat> um, first, we ought to understand the, the code itself is, is aspirational. I don't regard it as does my, my good friend Amanda Frost, as, as, as binding. But to, to set up a disciplinary mechanism, I think is just a cure worse than any disease of occasional misconduct by the courts. You could have a disciplinary mechanism in which uh, people, people file complaints with the justices themselves, who would then set up some sort of a mechanism to resolve the complaints, as occurs under, with the judicial councils under the Judicial Conduct and Disability Act, in a body that's collegiality is being strained already. I don't think injecting that kind of a thing into the court makes an awful lot of sense. The alternative, of course, is to have lower court judges receive the complaints, and there is a potential for even more mischief. Um, sometimes a, a sanction on a judge who is found to have committed misconduct is to relieve them of their caseload for a while. Do you want to have a couple of lower court judges telling a Supreme Court justice you have to sit out a couple of cases? Uh, imagine the consequences of that. So. As I say, uh, there are a lot of instances of Supreme Court justices engaging in questionable conduct. I've detailed them in my article on the subject. But to try to fix it with imposing that kind of a me mechanism seems to me to be folly. Thank you. Professor Frost, what signal would it send if the Supreme Court decided that Congress cannot pass laws regulating judicial ethics or procedure? Um, I think that would be extremely troubling. I was troubled by uh, Chief Justice Roberts' 2011 report. I mean, in part because he was commenting on a legal issue that might come before him. Um, uh, and because in that report, he, su he suggested, he didn't state outright, but he suggested that there might be a constitutional problem should Congress impose ethics legislation. 
I, I'm hopeful now that perhaps upon rethinking this issue and maybe in consultation with his colleagues, they are now moving to a different position. Not that Congress lacks the constitutional authority, but re let's not test that issue. How do we avoid testing that issue? We create a code for ourselves. That's what I'm hopeful this conversation is leading towards. And what would the consequences be to our constitutional structure if the Supreme Court did issue such a ruling? Um, well, so there's been lots of fascinating examples in this nation's history of what I will call the showdowns between Congress and the courts. And sometimes the courts back off and sometimes Congress backs off. What typically happens is the American people in some way, shape, or form decide through their views of these two institutions. And frankly, if the Supreme Court were to issue a, such a self-dealing opinion that said Congress, which is supposed to, under the Constitution, regulate, uh, regulate us in all sorts of ways, lacks the authority to keep us ethically uh, within bounds, I would hope that, in part, the public reaction would be powerful and would affect the court. And there's lots of examples and, and scholarship to show the court responds to public opinion. We know that. Um, and finally, on this subject, uh, for Professor Frost and, and Gay, how do you see judicial ethics recusal and disclosure reforms as fitting within the separation of powers doctrine? Or well, did you just answer that? Yes, well, although I, went, I will make one point, which is I care enormously about the independence of the court. And uh, to use the term Professor Jay has, has used, decisional independence. I would be uh, very upset to see Congress try to control the decisions of the court by penalizing the court for issuing decisions whose outcomes they don't like. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about uh, regulating the court as an institution. And that is appropriate and well within the bounds of what Congress has always done. So I care very much about protecting the separation of powers when it comes to the court's decisional independence. And it's appropriate and within the Constitution structure for Congress to oversee the institution of the courts through such legislation as we've been discussing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will now uh, hear five minutes of questions from the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Biggs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate all of you being here. It's been very interesting, and I appreciate. I want to. I want to go with what Professor Frost was just talking about, because as uh, as you sit here and we're talking, and I think of the Judiciary Act of 1789, where we did Congress, you know, set a precedent of getting in and, and basically setting up a court from a very I would say some fine tuning, some administrative uh, issues and, and setting it up. And you get to the point of separation of powers. Um, what is, and we talk about this, we talk about this all the time anyway, at least in my, my little group in Congress we do. What is it, what, you know, where, where do we set these boundaries? What, what do you see as the legitimate check on, on the independent judiciary from, from this branch? And that's it. all of you, just, and just be, be as brief as you can, but as extensive as you can, uh, knowing that I might have some follow-up questions for you. Well, I, I think the, the, the array is pretty significant. The 100-ton gun is the power to impeach and remove judges. Mm -hmm. right. uh, there is the power over the budget to make sure they're not engaging wa in, in wasteful spending. There's the power to establish lower courts, by implication disestablish lower courts, and regulate their operations uh, fairly extensively, their practice, their procedure, their administration. Jurisdiction. What? And their jurisdiction. Yes, I mean, and, and, and their, I mean, I say, and their Administrate jurisdiction, yes. Uh, and uh, I think that there's also the power to, of the necessary and proper power to make sure that they're, you know, they have the framework necessary to create the Judicial Conference of the United States, to create the Administrative Office, to create the, uh, the, the uh, Federal Judicial Center that, that uh, where Russell used to work. And so I think that there, that's kind of the, the array, and at the Supreme Court level, to manage its jurisdiction as well. One other thing I'd add, if that's the power of o oversight, Seems to me Congress has, has the authority to oversee the operation of the federal courts and it should exercise it. It's good for the federal courts to have someone looking at their operations. That's important as well. And, and recent history bears that out, right? You have the Ethics and Government Act of 1978 that uh, applied to the justices in terms of disclosure, the Ethics Reform Act of 1989. So every 20 or 30 years of the history of the country, there's been some form of Judiciary Act, which in most cases applies both to the justices and the lower court judges. I agree with everything that my fellow panelists said. I just want to add, I think this kind of legislation should not be viewed as diminishing or undermining the courts, but as strengthening it. And that's one of Congress's roles, to protect and strengthen the courts. So when we, when we look at Article 3, Section 1, and we talk about, and it says specifically that, that uh, 
the justices shall hold their offices during good behavior, right? It's not lifetime, it's good, but it's good behavior. And um, expand on what you've been talking about this morning on, on the authority of the legislative branch to basically monitor or check bad behavior. And we talked about, we just talked about some of that, but if you would, um, and we're, we're taking this right into the ethics of the Supreme Court justices in particular. I mean, I think there's, there is the argument of there being a gap between the high crimes and misdemeanors that are subject to removal for impeachment and less than good behavior uh, that is subject potentially to regulation. And the Judicial Conduct and Disability Act of 1980 tries to fill that gap by creating a disciplinary mechanism within the federal judiciary, uh, which I think is and has been deemed constitutional uh, for reasons that, that Mr. Wheeler gave. I am on board with the notion that it's a bad idea to extend that to the Supreme Court, but I think that is that middle ground that is open to regulation by the, by the, uh, by the Congress. Professor Wheeler. Uh, I, don't, I really have nothing, nothing to add to that. Uh, uh, I'll yield back my time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so we're good there. All right. And I appreciate you, you being here and um, look forward to the rest of this hearing. The gentleman yields back and we will now recognize the other gentleman from Arizona, uh, Mr. Stanton. All right, thank you very much, uh, Chairman Johnson. Thank you for holding this important hearing. Thank you to the um, uh, witnesses. I'm a new member of Congress and I'm would surprised and even shocked that there isn't a code of conduct for a United States Supreme Court to build confidence, public confidence in that incredibly important institution. We can do this and, and do it right and strike the necessary uh, balances. Um, this is a question for all witnesses. In uh, Caperton v. Massey, the Supreme Court recognized, quote, judicial integrity is a state interest of the highest order and that judicial codes of conducts are, quote, served to maintain the integrity of the judiciary and the rule of law, unquote. How do we square these statements with the court's refusal to adopt a code of conduct for itself? Professor Frost, wanna go jump in first? Um, maybe human nature <laughs> seems to play a role here. I think that is of course one of the interesting catch-22s of recusal where judges decide for themselves whether to recuse or a Supreme Court that says, we don't want a code of ethics but we'll follow the one that exists that doesn't apply to us. I think it's just very difficult um, for the justices to both live up to their highest ideals and also to avoid public criticism, some of it unfair, um, for not following a code that was not designed for them. So I'm gonna reference um, Professor Jay's excellent written testimony where he discussed um, how uh, Justice Scalia um, and Justice Thomas spoke at a fundraiser. That clearly violates the code of conduct that Chief Justice Roberts had said we all follow. But the answer is not, perhaps that was appropriate to speak at that fundraiser. I think that's an open question. I think it's actually very good when justices give uh, public speeches at many different events to educate the public about the, what they do. The question is that because the court itself had not come up with a code that was specific to the, those nine people and their preeminent role in our system of justice, they run the risk of, of violating a code that maybe isn't appropriate to them. I'd rather see them come up with a code obviously with a lot of public scrutiny and public participation to make sure that it's appropriate. That would have their highest ideals, their best goals uh, for how to behave. And then having signed on to it, I would hope that for the most part they would obey it. And if they didn't, we'd have, I think, a lot of public discussion and public controversy about why they didn't, which hopefully would help keep everyone in line. All right, thank you. Any other witnesses, Mr. Roth? Sure, just, just two quick points. One, I, it's, when you talk about Caperton, it's part of what I call the self-referential docket, right? There are certain cases that the Supreme Court have come out with certain opinions that they don't reflect back on themselves, right? They, there's a case in Missouri saying that it's okay to term limit judges, yet they serve for life. There's a case, the SSV Texas, Nebraska Press Association, v. Stewart, v. Stewart allowing journalism and broadcast journalism in courtrooms, yet they don't allow cameras or live audio in the courtroom. Similarly with Caperton v. Massey, it's uh, avowing how important judicial ethics are, but they don't have ethics. So that, that to me, means that Congress needs to step in and fill in the gap and actually uh, uh, write a code for them since they clearly don't feel that interested in doing it themselves. Or if they say they did, well, you know, I don't know if we necessarily should trust that they're gonna, that it's gonna be a, a high level code. The code is not just for the benefit of the public to build confidence in the Supreme Court. It's also for the protection of the members of the Supreme Court themselves. 
Uh, Mr. Wheeler, do you have a no, comment? I, I, think that's, I think that's the key point. And there is a view that the uh, Supreme Court, because it doesn't have a code, is a kind of a, a, a judicial ethics no man land. And I think the court would, it, it, I, I, it seems to me the court is its own self-interest to adopt a code, put to rest the, all these arguments about why it doesn't have a code, and exhibit a, um, a, a seriousness about this, which we haven't seen. Sometimes the, I'm not going to name names, but sometimes the justices have, have been asked about, in, in hearings like this one, about the, their ethical regulations. And frankly, the answers they give are wrong. I just don't understand what they're, well, I'm not going to say they don't understand what they're talking about, but they, they give incorrect answers which I don't think is a sign of their weakness. It's just they don't give enough attention to this matter th th as they should. And they could put a lot of it to rest by adopting a code. It's I mean, not for me to tell the Supreme Court what to do, but that's my view of it. Sadly, in recent years, uh, nominees of the US Supreme Court from both parties have been dragged through the mud in the nomination process. Uh, the, and big money has been spent, a lot of dark money, big money has been spent from outside interests who want to influence the Senate's confirmation progress. Should Congress do anything about that? Professor. Um, I completely agree that the confirmation process is now deeply troubled and that it is time, high time, for that process to be revamped and restructured and for there to be a robust conversation followed by a set of principles and guidelines going forward. We do not want to see any justice go through the system that we have in place now. It is bad for those justices and it is bad for the court. Um, so I very much hope that will change. What are your ideas? Um, oh, next <laughs> time. All right, next time. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we will now hear five minutes from the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Klein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think it's because it's a flyout day. I think that's why the gavel is quick today. I. Uh, I want to thank our witnesses for being here. I, I uh, read your testimony in, with interest, and I agree that transparency and accountability are, are critical for the successful operation of our courts. We need to encourage that and, and promote that. I also believe that it's a resolved question on here, but uh, um, that Congress does have the authority under Article One, Section 8 to regulate the courts. Um, I, I think that... Uh, there's general unanimity that uh, uh, the Supreme Court should operate under a code of conduct. Um, the question is, um, should it be, w is it preferable to have it imposed by the Supreme Court or should we seek to impose it upon them and what are the unintended consequences of that? I think that uh, leads us down a, a rabbit hole that Professor Frost uh, spoke of that that could potentially lead to a greater constitutional crisis than not imposing one. But uh, I would ask the witnesses uh, for a, a, really just a yes or no answer. I think, uh, should the Supreme Court have a code of conduct, yes or no? Yes. Mr. Frost, yes. Mr. Roth? Yes. Mr. Wheeler? Of course, yes. And Professor yes. Jay. And now, yes or no, is it preferable to, for them to adopt their own code uh, to us imposing one on them, yes or no? It's preferable for them to adopt their own code. I think equally preferable. No, equally? I, yes. No, no the, the court should adopt the code itself. I think that's, that's, that's the preferable course. I agree with, they should adopt their own code. Okay. Um, I noted from Professor Frost's testimony, uh, in your overview, the recusal laws do apply to the court, the Ethics and Government Act of 78, dealing with income reports applies to the court. The Ethics Reform Act of 89 applies to the court. Um, the Judicial Council's Reform and Judicial Conduct and Disability Act of 1980 does not. Um, that deals with complaints and the review of complaints. Do you think that should apply to the court? And if so, who should be filing complaints? How should those be reviewed? And are you again um, opening something that is going to have unintended consequences and make the operation of the courts more challenging um, and more subject to partisan uh, attack. Professor Frost. So as I just answered, yes, there should be a code of conduct for the court. I explained it's preferable for the court to come up with one, but if it won't, then I would say this, this body should. Your question is, well, what about a mechanism to investigate and sanction the justices?
obviously short of impeachment, which is always something this body can do. And there I'd say that I think um, uh, Mr. Wheeler, who mentioned sometimes the cure can be worse than the disease, I would go, I would hesitate to create a disciplinary mechanism for the justices. First of all, I think the nine of them do in fact informally discipline each other, at least in history, looking back at, at history, we've seen some examples of justices refusing, for example, to allow a particular justice who they think may not, no longer be of sound mind to be the sole deciding vote on a case. The justices protect themselves and sanction themselves a bit. Um, I think also as both Congress's oversight and members of the public, we should all be vigilant and we should speak out and criticize the court and we think it's overstepped and that is in a way a public censure and sanction. I, I would hesitate, I would, I would be against having either lower court judges um, have a, a method of overseeing the court or um, giving to the, the nine themselves the ability to investigate complaints through something like the Judicial Conduct and Disability Act. I think that would be worse than the problem we're trying to solve. But isn't giving the um, the Judicial Council or conference the ability to create this code that exactly that uh, oversight and influence? So I, I think I agree with my fellow panelists here who said that the um, uh, the Judicial Conference should not be charged with coming up with a code for the Supreme Court. Rather, the uh, court itself should be encouraged to come up with a code, or we could find uh, this, this body, I think, at the last instance, could be the one to come up with a code. I would hesitate to have the Judicial Conference do it um, because it does not regulate the Supreme Court. It's made up of judges who are overseen by the Supreme Court, and it itself has said it does not think that role is appropriate. Really quickly, should we allow citizens to file complaints against Supreme Court justices for violations? Um, you know, I guess maybe the, the semantics. Should we allow citizens to say there's a code of conduct in place? This is in the future where I'm imagining such a code. There's a code of conduct in place and a justice has violated it? Yes, that should be a very loud and very public conversation when that happens. Thank you. Our next uh, questioner will be uh, the gentleman from Florida, uh, Congressman Deutsch, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thanks to the witnesses for being here. The, the pinnacle of our nation's judicial system, the United States Supreme Court, doesn't have a written code of ethics. They're the only court within the judicial branch that doesn't have a code of ethics. It's confounding that the Supreme Court's nine lifetime members have, uh, have spoken about but have not yet drafted and enacted a code. And Professor Frost, um, it is, I think um, little consolation that justices informally discipline each other from time to time. Uh, the lower federal courts comply with the code of conduct for U.S. judges. Every state court, as we've discussed today, complies with the code of ethics that's been enacted by the state, that, that modeled on the ABA's model code. I, I've got many significant concerns about the lack of a written judicial code of ethics for the Supreme Court, um, it, but it's had a direct impact on the confirmation process of the newest justice. I'd like to just explore that a bit. Um, after Judge Kavanaugh was confirmed by the Senate, but before he was sworn in as a justice, Chief Justice Roberts referred 15 complaints against Judge Kavanaugh to the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals. Chief Justice Roberts instructed the Tenth Circuit to form a judicial council to review the complaints. As the Tenth Circuit Judicial Council commenced its review, the 15 complaints grew to 83, but then on December 18th, the Tenth Circuit Judicial Council determined that it didn't have jurisdiction to review the complaints due to Judge Kavanaugh being sworn in as a justice on the Supreme Court. So I'm the chairman of the House Ethics Committee. We lose jurisdiction over members of this body. We lose jurisdiction to enforce the rules of the House, the ethics rules, when a member leaves the House of Representatives. Judges, it seems now, in the judicial branch of government, the ethics laws no longer are binding on judges once a judge is confirmed to a lifetime appointment on the United States Supreme Court. It doesn't, it doesn't seem quite right. I think it's understandable that people would be puzzled by, the, by this situation that we find ourselves in, specifically this process for reviewing substantive ethics complaints against sitting judges who ultimately are confirmed uh, to become members of the Supreme Court. So that specific situation, I wonder if any of our witnesses have thoughts. Yes, Mr. Wheeler. 
It, well, it's, it, all they're doing is applying the statute. The statute definition of judge to whom the, the act applies is a magistrate judge, bankruptcy judge, district judge, and circuit judge. Excludes the Supreme Court. So, so, so just as when Judge Kaczynski resigned his, re retired from the bench entirely, mm -hmm. the Second Circuit Judicial Council, to whom that complaint was referred, lost jurisdiction. So too, when Justice Kavanaugh was no longer a judge of the Court of Appeals, the the, the statute lost its jurisdiction over him. And what you could, you could amend the statute. And what happened as a result? The, the, the event, what happened to the investigation as a result? Well, it, it died. It, I mean, it, it had no reason to exist because. Right. And if and it, right. Well, I, I I would quibble with the suggestion it had no reason to exist. I mean, it was there was a very serious reason for it to exist. I guess my question is, if if the confirmation had been delayed by a year, how would that have invest? How would that investigation have proceeded? That's my question. Under the existing law for judge that applies to judges. I mean, up until the point that he was confirmed and was sworn in, well, just off the cuff, I guess all I could say is off the cuff, you have a very messy situation on your hands because you have someone pending right. for confirmation and a, and a judicial counsel out in Denver evaluating his, his conduct during the confirmation hearing. I don't know what, uh, I'm not going to spell out what's going to happen. It seems to me it would, it would be well, quite, on, quite a novel. Well, it's still ongoing. The, 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 the judicial conference... Uh, the, the 10th Circuit dismissed the complaints. It got kicked to the Judicial Conference uh, Committee on, they have several committees, one of their committees, so they're still reviewing the complaints. That, that's still ongoing. I, I think that, you know, just overall, we want to be sure that, you know, what the, the proposals that we're doing today you know, predate Kavanaugh. They're not trying to single out any individual justice. You know, we could go back 30 years and talk about ethical complaints. I, I understand your concerns, and I do yeah. think there are things that we can do to, to, ch to change the law, right? Kaczynski shouldn't be getting his $200,000 a year pension. That's very, very well within Congress. There's about a dozen justice judges who've retired in the last 10 years because of misconduct who are still getting huge pensions, and that, there's definitely language that can be inserted in the law. But as soon as you get, become a justice, you know, that becomes a question, uh, you know, an extra judicial question. That's, that's again, up to you guys, but, but uh, you know, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't see how you square the two. Thank you. Thank you. We will now have five minutes of questions from the gentleman from Pennsylvania, uh, Congressman Reshenthala. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Um, I'm really troubled by a lot of the recommendations. I was a magisterial district judge. Uh, I was a rather young magisterial district judge, but... The disclosure of information is troubling. Uh, there was a district judge in Pennsylvania who uh, his father-in-law was killed because there's an assassination attempt on the district judge. You're dealing with some bad individuals. Um, you're sending people to jail, uh, provoking their freedom. I, I just think uh, the disclosures are troubling. The recusal explanation is also, <clears throat> it's counterintuitive because as a judge, you would only recuse for certain personal reasons. If you require a judge to then say why he or she is recusing, it would actually have the unintended consequence of keeping the judge on the case, because he or she might not want to say why they're recusing themselves. So I actually think that there's an unintended consequence here that actually thwarts what you're trying to do, right? And actually forces a judge to, it puts a judge in an uncomfortable position where they may, where they otherwise wouldn't be in. So I understand where you're coming from, but I just think it's not thought through. And with that, I'm going to uh, yield to my colleague from Alabama. Well, thank you for yielding. And um, I guess that because we're pushing up against votes being called, so maybe no round two. So thank you. I'm going to pick up where we left off. I was, I was expressing some concerns about uh, forum shopping. And uh, similarly is where I left off. Uh, could public explanations for recusal result in attorneys abusing those explanations uh, to attempt to disqualify a judge um, that they deem unfavorable? I mean, it's, it's possible. I mean, you know, to, to your example, if you have an AT&T versus Smith in, in the Western District of Texas, you know, AT&T is a big uh, company, maybe they would want to sue. In the Eastern District, I, th I think that's already happening. In terms of trying to get judges off of cases, the Judicial Conference uh, and the Supreme Court actually put forth a, a, an opinion saying that, you know, if you're an amicus and you're putting this, putting this amicus on the record just to get a judge or justice off the case, you, you can't submit that amicus. So I, I think that there's, look, this is an ongoing conversation. You know, there are a lot of misrecusals recently, so this is sort of, you know, what we've come up with as, as a good uh, uh, response. 
And then, you know, I, I don't think that, you know, one law that's passed is, go is going to be the end to the story. These are, the, and the, the reason I bring up these points is because I think it's, it's very important as we're having this discussion. These have to be, as I said in my opening statement, very well thought out and discussed um, ideas. And so I, it, it's interesting to see all of the different perspectives though represented here um, on each of these uh, issues. And so again, I just want to thank you all for being here today. I do want to point out one other concern that uh, was uh, brought out in the letter dated June 19th, uh, 2019, um, from the Judicial Conference, um, signed by um, uh, James Duff. Um, and, and this is also uh, a, a concern. Were a judge to specify the nature of every recusal explicitly, um, and, and ha already been mentioned multiple times about the security uh, uh, questions, but um, or by implication that a disqualification is not related to financial conflict, the effect could be to expose personal information needlessly about the litigant and or prejudice the litigant before the judge's colleagues. And I think that also is a very important point uh, to, uh, to make as well. So um, I appreciate the gentleman uh, yielding. I would like to, Mr. Chairman, enter into the record uh, this letter. I'd ask for unanimous consent. Without objection, so ordered. And I yield back to Mr. Rushenthaler. Thank you. I yield the remainder of my time. Thank you. Uh, our uh, next uh, interrogator is the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cohen. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Interrogator is not going to be the right term. I came a little late, so I might have missed some of your earlier. I, missed, I did miss most of your earlier testimony. I'd just like to ask uh, whoever wants to respond, have any of the justices said that they were interested in doing their own the nodder. I can't read too well. Is it Mr. Roth? Y yes. Uh, at the uh, a, a hearing before the House uh, Appropriations Subcommittee on Financial Services and General Government, uh, Justice Kagan reported that Chief Justice Roberts was considering writing a code for uh, the judiciary, which is a, is a positive step, but I would just counsel that given uh, you know, previous uh, activities uh, demonstrate future results. I, I think that it's in just, you know, you're, we'd be in a better situation if it were Congress writing that code. I, I, I would trust that more than it would if it was coming from the judiciary itself. When was that? Uh, she mentioned that in March of this year. In March. Um, and there hasn't been any further uh, information from the court since then. They have a lot of restrictions or requirements to give notice and limitations on monies and that are, I guess, mostly through Congress, and they abide by them pretty much, I guess, but they don't file their papers on the internet. Is that right? That's right. We, I, I have to fill out a form, uh, which I have right here, you know, by pen. I got to fax it in or email it in. And then, you know, within a few weeks, I'll, I'll get back those in a, on a thumb drive. And then they're in a, a very hard to read format. So I change the format and then I post them on fixthecourt.com. Is the reason for that that the court is a, considers longstanding judicial tradition important? I, I think it is. <laughs> it would be very easy for them to, you know, I've, I've been told there's metadata, there's personalizing information. There's not. Just make it a PDF and upload it to uscourts.com. Well, I just want to say, unless we close, that I have the utmost respect for Justice Roberts. I think I feel comfortable with his position. I feel confident that he will do the right thing. And I pray and I hope that he does the right thing at the right time, to paraphrase Dr. John, when the cases come before him to save the Republic. And he'll back the balance of my time. Uh, I thank the gentleman. Uh, we will now have five minutes from the gentleman from Louisiana, uh, Congressman Johnson. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. I want to just follow up on a, a little bit of what a couple of my colleagues have pointed on, just with regard to the idea, of the general idea of separation of powers. And um, I, I had a couple of questions for Mr. Wheeler. Um, based on your time on the Breyer Committee and the Federal Judicial Center, how do you explain this to uh, to a layman, you know, to a non-lawyer? Does, does the does the Congress have the constitutional authority to force the Supreme Court to adopt a code of conduct? I, I, I probably want to yield to my, my colleagues, who, both of whom teach constitutional law, but yeah, on the face of it, I think it does have the authority to require the court to adopt a code of conduct. I just think as a practical matter, it would be much better if the court were to do it, do it on its own. 
I mean, we can't add much to that. Before you yield to the, the other scholars, let me ask you this. You, you, you cited, um, I think in your written statement, a 2011 year-end report that was authored by Chief Justice uh, John Roberts. Right. And in that report, Justice Roberts discussed the constitutionality of Congress creating a set of ethics for lower courts, but he, but he made the point that it was uh, per the enumerated powers under Article III. And I wonder if you could expand on the, the concept of lower courts being created by Congress and some of the constitutional reasonings for why a, a code that was designed for lower courts may not necessarily apply to the Supreme Court. What, what Chief Justice Roberts said in the 2011 year in report was, as, as, as Professor Jay has said, we really don't know whether or not Congress has the authority to pose these things on the, the Supreme Court. It hasn't been tested. Um, but his basic argument was that the Constitution created the Supreme Court. That puts it in a different posture than the so-called lower courts, which are created by Congress pursuant to constitutional authorization. And that's where he left it. And you get scholars on both sides to examine whether or not that is really a sound analysis. OK, one more. In, in your testimony, you stated that often the reasons for recusal are fairly obvious, and, and requiring reasons for all recusals could start judicial ethics reg regulation down a slippery slope because the reasons could involve delicate personal matters. Mr. Reschenthaler was referencing some of that. Um, what, what do you think would be the benefit of, of making a judge's personal matters public like that? I know there's a lot of concern about it. I can't see any particular benefit in making a, details of some sort of salacious interchange that a judge or the judge's spouse had. I can't see any benefit of that. Let me add one thing, though. You know, who, where, the, where this whole question of recusal is really being wrestled with is in the states. The states, partly because of the, uh, the uh, uh, conflicts created by judicial campaigning and financing, but beyond that, I think the states, some of the states like Texas, are really looking very seriously about recusal policies. And I think it would behoove the federal courts and the Congress to look at what the states are doing because they're being very creative and, and very thoughtful in their analysis of this whole matter. This is sort of a follow-up on that. But I mean, I was a practicing attorney for 20 years. And, and it seems to me that there would be a risk you could open a Pandora's box if you start making publicly available explanations for recusal. I mean. Uh, Attorneys might abuse that. You know, they might take the explanations to attempt to disqualify a judge they deem unfavorable. And you could see how that information could be misused, I think. So I, that, that's one of the concerns. Would you? Well, no, that? I, that's just that's one of those difficult questions of balancing a couple of, of, of competing valid interests. Um, I, I've said, I'm on record of saying, I think by and large, judges ought to state the reasons for their recusal. And there's several reasons for that transparency for appellate review and also to create a common law of recusal. But I, I, I think there's a, a difficult matter in this rather narrow range of personal and perhaps salacious information that judges might not want to reveal at the even the risk of not recusing when they should. But it's also for, oh, sorry. Go, go ahead, go ahead. No, well, just recently there was a judge in the Fifth Circuit who recused in a case, uh, James Ho, and there was this uproar on the left, oh, he's recusing because he's got a per No, it's because his former... It, it took a little while to find out, but we learned that it was because his former law firm was involved in the case, and it sort of tamped down that partisanship. So I think there is sort of that positive, like, let's calm down. They're not, you know, abusing the system, you know, but we just don't know about it, so certain elements among us are going to assume the worst. That's well said. Uh, Professor, is it Guy? Is that how it? Jay. Jay, sorry. In your written testimony, you stated that this, this subcommittee should not pass legislation imposing a code of ethics on its, of its own, nor should we direct the judicial conference to issue a code of conduct applicable to the justices. Why is the judicial conference not the appropriate mechanism to re regulate the Supreme Court? Because the judicial conference is responsible for governing lower court judges, um, and uh, they, in effect, the, Supreme, the justices of the Supreme Court oversee those lower right. judicial conference judges, both in, as designated supervisors of their circuits and as a, a high court. And so, to me, I think it's just a poor idea to have the supervisees regulate the ethics of the supervisors. I tend to agree. I'll yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I next recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Correa, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you very much for holding this most important hearing. I want to thank our witnesses for being here today. Uh, checks and balances, the third branch of government is so darn critical, especially in these times when the executive and of course, uh, our ex uh, legislative branch are debating issues. Um, question to all of you with reference to financial disclosure. I, I hear what you're saying with reference to self-policing. Uh, to my knowledge, there's no financial disclosures right now online by members of the Supreme Court. Is that correct? Just the ones that I've put there myself. 
on fitsports.com, but I had to get them and jump through hoops to get them. And I think my thought is, look, as, as a person who's been in, in elected office for a number of years, I do a lot of work to make sure I'm fully transparent. I even go further than what is required by the law to make sure that I comply with every nuance of the law when it comes to financial transparency. Um, it guides me in terms of where I invest my personal resources because I try to avoid conflict of interest the best of my ability. You said what's disclosed is what you put online, yet, you know, in campaigning, there's enough people doing op research out there that essentially know what every justice owns, what they do. And to me, the thought of, okay, it should be very simple and just, you know, so police, I don't know who writes the letter or signs the letter to the Supreme Court saying, please write your own code of ethics. So we gotta figure that one out. But number two is, what's the downside to having full disclosure? Haven't done it, there's gotta be a reason it's very uncomfortable, I know, but it should be done. Why? Well, the reason that has been offered here is private information can jeopardize the judge's safety, and to my answer to that is you have redaction. But to me, it's already there. I mean, you just have an op research person who can put this stuff well, out. Maybe so, but I do understand where identifying, for example, relatives and family members of judges who could, you know, that you redact those, but then you, but then you do post it publicly. I mean, to me, the, the, the problem is that we're having this odd, I mean, to me, it's a rather odd argument that we're having because as a practical matter, these things are posted online. It's just they're being posted by him instead of by the court. And so why, what, you know, what's the privacy problem with having the court just do it? I mean, post the same things they give to him. Um, and and I, I, I don't see, if, if they carefully redact all sensitive information and just publish the stuff that needs to, that the, the public has a right to see, then why online is a problem? I just don't get. So I'm not missing something. I don't think so. We're not missing anything. I just want to add that there's been now a number of comments about how pu making publicly available reasons for recusal and possibly also some of the financial data could be manipulated or abused by lawyers who are practicing before judges and maybe trying to select a judge. So two quick points. One but you is, can do that already. Well, yes. You, one is you, you can know, do that already. It's a big case. You're going to do your own research, op research, and say, hey, this and, is the And issue. second, even if you get a judge recused, you cannot then pick the replacement judge. And Correct. third, Rule 11 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure provides an ability to sanction lawyers who take action for improper purposes. And this would be a classic example of that. So all those things, I think, protect. Thank you. Other comments? Mr. Chairman, I just uh, would like to nominate you to write that letter to the Supreme Court asking that they uh, adopt rules of ethics. With that, I yield the remainder of my time. Thank you. Thank the gentleman, uh, and with that, uh, our hearing today is concluded. Thanks to our uh, distinguished witnesses for appearing and testifying. Without objection, all uh, members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witnesses or additional uh, materials for the record. The hearing is adjourned. I don't exactly see anything sinister in the past. It's marginal.